Um, so one of the things we love at Innovation Leader is the chance to visit and talk with executives at companies like Disney, Microsoft, Google, Autodesk, and General Motors. And everything we're going to cover in the webcast today is based on visits and conversations that we've had uh, with those companies and with others. So I always like to mention, uh, not a consultancy. Um, you know, we publish a magazine, a website, lots of case studies, and uh, most of our members are large Global 1000 organizations. So I, I like this, uh, this cartoon uh, because it describes the challenge that most large organizations have when it comes to um, innovation and balancing innovation with mergers and acquisition. You can see the muscle on the right is the M&A muscle. Most companies are really good at um, acquiring innovation, whether it's a startup or another large company that maybe has a product that fills some kind of um, gap that they don't. But the muscle on the left, the in an internal innovation muscle, or maybe you want to call it the organic innovation muscle, uh, isn't really well developed. So that's that's a lot of what we focus on. It's a lot of what we see large companies focusing on is how do you build innovation balance um, and really make sure that you're able to do innovation internally within your company as well as acquiring innovation. So what's happening these days to address um, that muscle imbalance? Well, these are kind of five quick ideas that we're hearing about a lot in 2016. Um, the first one is really borrowing an idea from that came out of the startup ecosystem in Silicon Valley, the, the lean startup approach. Um, and our most recent research report, which came out in June, um, focuses all about lean startup, all on lean startup in large organizations. But to summarize, it's, uh, you know, it's a much faster way to prototype, to talk to customers, to pivot, to refine, uh, and to bring things to market uh, that you know meet a customer need as opposed to developing it for 18 months or two years before you show it uh, to the first customer. Uh, the second thing is, is really, if you're an innovation person inside a large cor corporation, we feel um, most are having to make the choice between are you a consultancy or a service provider to your business units, or are you an innovation skunk works that's responsible for prototyping, developing new concepts, cultivating ideas, and really helping maybe launch them through the business units? Um, but you know, do you have that ability to develop a product or service yourself, or are you doing workshops? Are you doing training? Are you doing market research or in other ways supporting the existing business units? Uh, and you can see on the right uh, is a Toyota kind of futuristic uh, electric concept car. Um, Toyota, which we'll talk about in a few slides, uh, really, I think, has made that choice. Uh, this new Toyota Research Institute is, is really fits the Skunk Works model. Um, now, uh, idea number three is, is, seems pretty obvious, but it can be hard at a lot of companies, is bringing in outside perspectives to evaluate the ideas that you're developing and getting out of the building more. We like to say that there is so much, uh, so much incentive in a large company for going to meetings in the building with your colleagues, with your superiors, with your direct reports, uh, and so little incentive to get out of the building and go to conferences, go to meetups, go to demo days or hackathons and kind of get those outside perspectives and maybe bring them in to evaluate your own um, idea challenges or competitions or to look at your pipeline and tell you, um, you know, how does it map to what they're seeing in the outside world? And this, an outside perspective could be anything from someone who used to work from your company and maybe is now an analyst or working for a startup. Um, it could be a venture capitalist or an angel investor that works in your industry, but um, kind of an independent authority to help uh, reality check what you're doing. The fourth thing we see a lot of companies doing these days is connecting with the startup ecosystem. And, you know, a lot of times uh, this this can kind of feel like a, a mating dance or a ritual that doesn't have a lot of purpose. So we like to say it's connecting with the startup ecosystem in meaningful ways with built in rewards. And meaningful can mean uh, that the the large company side of the of the dance uh, is defining here's an area that we are specifically looking for solutions, product services in, or uh, an area that we'd like to be more active in um, that we aren't today. And the built-in rewards part doesn't necessarily need to mean that you're investing in startups um, or eventually maybe buying startups, but a built-in reward could just be 
um, a clear structure for licensing uh, technology from a startup. Uh, it could be a prize. It could be free office space. It could be um, access to uh, your distribution network or your retail stores, but some kind of um, tangible upside that gives startups a reason to be engaging with you. And uh, number five is creating new kinds of spaces, whether you call it a lab or an innovation center or it doesn't even have a name, but you know, it's a space that has its own culture and own feeling and um, is, is somewhat different in the way that it looks and feels and operates from the mainline organization so that you can attract and retain different kinds of people. Uh, I want to run through seven quick examples here. Um, the Disney Accelerator is something that was launched last year in partnership with Techstars um, to bring Disney startups, uh, you know, presumably some of the top startups in media and video games and entertainment, um, give them office space for a few months on the Disney headquarters uh, lot in Southern California. Um, and most importantly, not just do the typical accelerator model of we'll give you a little bit of seed funding and we'll have a demo day at the end when you can present. But Disney um, actually matches up each startup in the Disney Accelerator with a, with a mentor um, at Disney that can kind of help them navigate the bureaucracy and also help give them input and presumably help make connections um, with people in Disney and throughout the entertainment industry. Um, they're just... Uh, in the midst of the second cycle of the program now, you can see June 27th was the start of their second year doing the program. We're heading towards their second demo day in October. Um, as a side note, Disney seems to have split from Techstars. Um, not totally clear on why, but uh, Disney has said they're going to continue running the accelerator themselves, just not uh, as a partnership with Techstars. The big success in the first cycle was this startup called Sphero that was before the Disney Accelerator, just developing these um, robotic toys, these balls that kids could play with um, in connection with an app on a smartphone or tablet, um, Sphero lucked out and their mentor was Disney's CEO, Bob Iger. And um, he suggested, hey, we are rebooting the Star Wars franchise. Could you develop a toy that plugs into the world of Star Wars droids? Uh, and they came up with the BB-8 uh, toy that was out. Uh, when the Star Wars Force Awakens movie came out last year um, and was a huge hit um, for the company, for both Disney and for Sphero in the fourth quarter of last year. So this is just a, you know, one good example of, um, of something a big company is doing that has a really specific focus, which is helping Disney think about the ways that entertainment and toys and games are changing um, in a very up close and personal sort of way, the demo day takes place on the Disney campus um, so that lots of Disney employees can experiencing it, experience it. Um, GE First Build is an initiative that I think we're going to be watching pretty closely since it came out of the GE Appliance Division in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, GE is part of its kind of continued evolution. Um, has sold off that division to uh, higher appliances of China. And um, all indications are that First Build is going to stick around. But First Build is basically uh, an open community maker space that GE set up uh, on the campus of University of Louisville. And it's something that uh, students at the school, uh, professors at the school, entrepreneurs in Louisville can come and use, no strings attached. But GE also hosts hackathons uh, with a specific strategic focus to them. You can see the one on the left there is uh, join us at First Build for uh, the future of appliances on September 24th of this year. And uh, in addition to creating this makerspace and hosting hackathons that have prizes, GE also um, has set up kind of a licensing arrangement where if ideas come through First Build that wind up being part of um, of a GE product, or I guess now a, a hair product, um, there actually is a, a royalty-based uh, uh, licensing deal that GE has spelled out. So it's clear that they're not just there to, you know, to um, see what cool stuff the entrepreneurs and inventors are doing, but that they actually have a pathway for it to be built, for some of these ideas to be built into GE products. 
Um, they've also, through First Build, been launching launching some products directly on uh, crowdfunding sites like Indiegogo. And one example that we wrote about um, recently is this ice maker called the Opal Ice Maker that apparently makes um, a sort of crunchy, porous ice that um, cocktail enthusiasts really like. And so that's an example of something coming through First Build and not necessarily going through the GE uh, production process and GE distribution, but going directly to a crowdfunding site where people can uh, can order it. And that was a pretty successful crowdfunding campaign for them, uh, I believe earlier this year, later last year. Toyota Research Institute is something uh, that was announced late last year, and Toyota is making a pretty significant financial contribution to it. I think it's about a billion dollar commitment over five years, um, and it has kind of two geographic. This is basically a, you know, a Skunk Works or a new kind of R&D organization that you can see from the mission statement is about using artificial uh, intelligence to improve the quality of human life. Uh, I think for, GE, for uh, Toyota's purposes, that means um, not just transportation, but you can also see in-home support of older, pers of older people. Um, so they're actually thinking about home robots and ways that they may assist the elderly in moving around their house and doing kind of daily, uh, daily tasks and chores. And so this is an example. In a way, you can think of it as 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 kind of creating a secondary R and D organization, mainly staffed by people who don't have the Toyota uh, blood running through their veins. You know, they're not part of the the Toyota R and D culture, but these are. Um, new employees that Gil Pratt, uh, the fellow in the photo down there, is bringing in to Toyota, uh, both in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and in Palo Alto, California, and trying to focus them on this mission, as opposed to having them be part of the established R&D organization, which is thinking about, you know, what, are, what what's going to happen in the 2018 model year, or the 2019 model year, and um, doing doing kind of more near-term research. Uh, so this is just an example, kind of an expensive example of saying um, we want to create a different kind of um, of research organization or uh, you could call it a skunk work sort of model. One of my favorite examples from 2015, and it was continued in 2016, is the Amazon picking challenge. Um, and in part, it's because Amazon put so little money into this initiative um, if you can read some of the text, I think uh, they laid out about $26,000 in prize money in 2015. I think it was somewhat more than that in 2016, but but uh, not into the millions of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars in prize money. But their goal was to get startups and academic researchers thinking about um, robots that can work in Amazon warehouses and actually pick products off of a shelving unit and put them into a box. Amazon today has robots in their warehouses that move product over to a human picking or order filling station, but they still employ lots of human beings. And particularly as we head into the fourth quarter, um, you know, huge amounts of temporary employees to fill holiday orders. So they're, the purpose of the picking challenge is to get the uh, innovators outside of Amazon's walls uh, developing new ways to um, you know, to manipulate products in the warehouse. And um, as I mentioned, they've gone through two cycles of this now. And the robots, while they're still uh, slower than a human, you can see kind of the, the trajectory of improvement. And, um, uh, you know, that this is potentially an area where uh, Amazon may make other acquisitions or may at some point wind up funding academic research uh, at different schools that maybe do well in the Amazon picking challenge, but very, very cost effective way to get the rest of the world thinking about a problem that Amazon cares about, which is more efficient warehouses. And when I've talked to some of the academic teams at places like MIT that are participating in this, they actually like having a concrete real world challenge to work on as opposed to sort of picking uh, whatever may be more abstract issues the you know the the professor or the department chair cares about. So this was just a nice way to get um, get lots of people focused on something that Amazon cared about. Adobe Kickbox 
is an initiative that we've been tracking for a few years, and we mentioned Lean Startup uh, at the beginning of the webcast. It's it's very much Lean Startup based. It's uh, you know the box itself contains um, a prepaid credit card with a thousand dollars on it. It has a Starbucks gift card um, to properly caffeinate you. Uh, I think there's some chocolate in there and some booklets that kind of um, hew to the Lean Startup methodology. And the goal is to have Adobe employees that participate in these kickbox workshops have the resources in the box and, and in the workshop itself to develop an idea um, either that they may come to the workshop with or they may uh, think up in the workshop and test it with actual customers. You know, the thousand dollars, while not a lot of money, uh, is enough money for Adobe employees to register a web domain and build a really simple website and even buy some Google advertising to get people to the website. Uh, and they have lots of examples of ideas that Adobe employees have tested and actually got people paying real money for um, before then looking for the commitment to develop it into a quote unquote uh, real product. Um, my colleague Scott Cohen points out that, um, you know, it's very much a no questions asked um, kind of initiative. Once you go through the, the initial kickbox workshop, all you really need to do to keep your idea alive is find one executive, uh, I think director level or above anywhere in the company that thinks it's a good idea uh, and can help you find resources and move it forward. There's no innovation committee where you have to, you know, say convince a dozen people um, that this is a good idea and deserves further resources. If you have one person that believes in it, you can keep moving it, uh, keep moving it forward. Um, and finally, as a as a last example here, hopefully let's, let's see if we can move this text here a little bit so everyone can see it. Um, so uh, you know, as a last example here, people talk about the um, this idea of the human API, and it's a pretty simple idea. Um, these are folks uh, who work at Ford, Houghton Mifflin, and John Hancock, just as examples. But um, you know, a software API is something that helps outside companies, startups, um, other entities interact with your technology platform. A human API is somebody who really is just the, the contact person or the point of entry into your company for people that want to um, co-create, co-innovate with you. Um, one of the things when you talk to people who work in the startup world and even for some medium-sized companies is they, they can get incredibly frustrated trying to collaborate with a large company because it's just hard to tell who is the right person um, to have this conversation. You know, hey, we'd love to, you know, to try something with you. We're doing some pop-up retail and we'd love to try to stock some of your products in it. Or we've got this great new mobile app and we need a launch partner. Um, you know, no startup or small company wants that to be a you know, a 12 month or 18 month process trying to find the right person. So we do see a lot of companies, these and others, creating a visible point person who you could find on the web or easily find on LinkedIn or find out in the world at meetups and conferences who can um, help introduce you to the right people in the organization and, you know, ideally help get collaborations and partnerships um, that are mutually beneficial uh, happening. Um, the final example that I wanted to share is um, something we wrote about recently. Uh, Lululemon, the apparel company, has these lab stores both in Vancouver and now in Manhattan. And the really interesting concept here is that they have a small group of designers in the back of the store that are working on new garments that are really specific to the particular geographical market. So, you know, not everybody uh, in New York is a, you know, is a, is a yoga aficionado. So what kinds of clothing could we design for people who are bicycle commuters in New York or people who, you know, want to go for a jog on their lunch hour, but, you know, maybe don't have the time to change out of uh, nice work clothes. Um, so these are kind of like a lot of the thinking in the lab store in New York is like multifunctional uh, garments that you could wear to the office and for other activities. Um, and the really interesting thing here from an innovation perspective is just that the people designing the garments are visible in the back of the store. They can go and see how something looks like on a rack. They can go and talk to customers. You know, they they can't help but see what customers are trying on um, when they go into the changing rooms, which are kind of in the middle of the store, 
or see how, how they look on people, see what people are bringing to the cash register. So, you know, again, this is a really interesting way of pilot testing new products in a retail store where people can actually bring them to a cash register uh, and buy them. So a uh, cool concept of clo closing the loop between designers and product developers uh, and real live customers. So um, I want to talk a little bit about why do innovation initiatives die? And some of this may not be surprising to you, but you know the, the two most common things you see happening are management changes and mergers and acquisitions uh, killing these initiatives. Um, you, you know, uh, on the left, Constant Contact had a pretty um, well-developed innovation program, including bringing in startups and giving them office space and mentorship, but also teaching design thinking within the company. Uh, that team seems to have disbanded after the company uh, was acquired by uh, a larger publicly traded company called Endurance International. At Turner, uh, I forget whether, I think this was 2014 as opposed to 2015, they had been doing an accelerator program in the Bay Area and also in Southern California called Media Camp, uh, but that initiative ended as did an emerging technologies outpost that they had in San Francisco, purely as a result of budget cuts. Uh, the Chubb example here, uh, they had a small innovation team that was um, building a really interesting platform, not just for collecting and sorting innovation ideas, but really kind of a communication and collaboration platform for the whole company, which I believe still exists, but uh, the small team that had been responsible for innovation at Chubb uh, has moved on to other things. Just a few more examples here. Um, uh, the Biogen example at the bottom, they had been building kind of a business innovation, business model innovation um, group that uh, was ended by uh, layoffs and, and budget cuts. Uh, the New York Times R&D Lab, I would, I would say we went to visit them last year. It was a fairly small group of five or six people working on really kind of conceptual products where it was a little bit hard to understand how things were going to move from that R&D Lab into the actual New York Times digital product or mobile product. So there it may have been an issue of, was the R&D lab working a little bit too far ahead of where the operating company really would have felt it was useful? Uh, the last image on this page is from Nordstrom, where they had been doing a lot of very nimble, uh, kind of cheap pilot tests of things in their stores um, with the Nordstrom Innovation Lab, I believe it was called. There is still an innovation initiative at Nordstrom. It's within the IT group, but it seems to really have um, have shrunk in size. And the other two points I would make um, with regards to Nordstrom and, and a few other programs we've seen are, you know, if you can't figure out how to get a pilot project out into production, and whether that's with your own resources or handing it over to the business units um, to roll it out so that you can have real concrete results to point to, um, you know, the sort of thing that business unit owners, uh, business unit executives feel is significant, the thing that the CEO and the board notice and feel is significant, um, you know, that tends to lead to a pretty short-lived innovation program. So we really like to emphasize having lots of relationships around the company, um, specifically relationships with business units that can help you bring things to market. Um, and uh, you know, really shifting away from this um, cultural program or training program uh, to a, a program that can really point to products, services, um, streamlining or cost cutting initiatives that you've helped launch that have real dollar value attached to them. That tends to uh, equal longevity in the world of innovation initiatives. I just want to, uh, to buttress that point, share a little bit of survey data with you uh, from our uh, 2015 benchmarking report. Um, about 44% of the of the respondents were $10 billion plus company. Um, you can see on this slide the things that they're using to measure progress and success. The number one thing was revenue generated from new products or innovation products. Um, the number two is projects in the pipeline. So how many things are, are you working on? Um, stage gate specific metrics, meaning how many things are, are 
getting closer to market. Um, but you'll see that rounding out the top four is profit and loss impact or other financial impact. So, you know, we really do see companies looking for, you know, for numbers, whether it's cost savings or revenue attached to these programs, as opposed to number of ideas uh, generated or, or number of pilots we've run or how many employees are involved in the program. Um, those are all great, but uh, we feel really does wind up turning innovation into more of an HR initiative than, uh, you know, a new product development, uh, future focused. Uh, how do we uh, develop new business models and reach new markets and, um, you know, frankly, a growth oriented, um, you know, a growth oriented program. And we do hear a lot more companies talking about um, growth as a product of the innovation in initiative, not just experiments and, and new ideas. Um, let's see, there's a question, what's happening to address that? Is it too ambitious or misguided to believe an innovation team can do all these activities simultaneously? So um, going back to this slide, uh, yeah, Randall, you know, I think the point is you don't wanna try to do too much and you do want to figure out, you know, in that first year of the program, you know, what are the things you have the resources to really move the needle on? And I would say that, you know, the biggest pitfall is is the kind of temptation to do the global tour, uh, doing innovation workshops in every geography where your company has presence or doing a big innovation awards program or things that can just kind of soak up. Um, soak up a lot of resources without delivering results. So I guess sort of to answer your question and tell me if you think I'm dodging it a little bit, um, we don't, you know, we don't like to do laundry lists of you should be doing these 28 things or even these five things. Um, this slide is really just five things that we're observing that are happening out there in the market. I think probably very few companies you could say are doing, you know, doing all five of these things. Um, I just wanted to share this slide about um, why projects get killed, um, you know, mainly to make the point that uh, the top and bottom reasons, you know, are no business unit buy-in, you know, which is gets back to that importance of relationships with the business units. Um, and the last one being conflict with businesses. Uh, and the second to last one being no senior buy-in. So um, just emphasizing the importance of relationships here um, and not being seen uh, as an outside uh, kind of satellite to the main business um, that isn't connected in, you know, in productive ways and is off doing its own thing and setting its own agenda. And, you know, we kind of sometimes call it the cool kid syndrome of like, hey, we have the coolest office space and we're hiring people with cool eyeglasses and, um, you know, uh, it can sometimes breed animosity. Uh, I want to end, and I'd love to take questions from you, just end with one more cartoon. Um, the caption here is, I guess the business units, I guess it turns out the business units wanted incremental improvements. Um, so really the importance here is whatever you're doing, uh, you don't necessarily need to be a servant to the business units, but the importance of aligning with them, aligning with the CEO, aligning with the board, just getting as much time um, and having as much communication with those constituencies as possible is really important because um, you know, some companies may be doing a far out Elon Musk type skunk works. Um, and it turns out what the business units really need is, uh, you know, is a way to cut out 15 percent of their uh, supply chain costs or is a way to um, reach a new geography or a new customer segment that they really haven't successfully been able to reach. Um, but you may be in a company where, you know, I think the Toyota example is a good one where they do want you to be. Um, working on jetpacks and cold fusion reactors and time machines, and that's okay um, as long as there's alignment and really clear communication. So I'd love it if you have um, questions and comments, uh, whether anonymously or um, uh, with your name. Uh, and also, you can always contact me, Scott, at innovationleader.com. Uh, we're also on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um, other companies that have adopted Adobe's Kickbox program, uh, yes, it's true. Uh, MasterCard, uh, we just wrote about, has kind of adapted the Kickbox program. They call it IdeaBox. I think they've defined a few sort of concrete 
stages of what happens to the ideas after, um, you know, kind of the nascent, um, you know, first prototype stage and kind of how you get more resources. Um, and uh, Hospital Corporation of America is also using it. The it Kickbox program, which I think you can find at kickbox.adobe.com is really open source. So they've, they've published almost all of their materials. Um, and the other thing I'd point you to in terms of that program is we, we had an article uh, written by one of the attorneys at Adobe talking about how they kind of tried to create a little more leeway um, than you might get, excuse me, from a, uh, from a typical legal department in terms of running kickbox experiments without causing, um, you know, causing legal problems uh, or risks for Adobe. So what about the challenge posed by putting someone at the helm of an innovation team or lab who's not well suited to drive innovative thinking? Yeah, it's a big problem. <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, it, it's hard to see uh, how, you know, if you had your typical command and control manager in charge of the innovation initiative, how that could lead to good stuff. You know, I would say the other problem sign that we see a lot of companies running into, frankly, is building up an innovation team that's entirely staffed by company veterans and people who have worked most of their career for company X. Um, you know, the flip side of that is companies that are good at mixing the people who kind of know where the bodies are buried and know how to get things done in the company with outsiders. Um, you know, and we certainly see some initiatives like the Shell TechWorks initiative, where they really are trying to hire more people from outside the oil and gas industry than from inside the industry or from inside Shell. So, um, Sarah, I don't, uh, you know, uh, I hope it's not depressing, but I don't think uh, it's a great formula <laughs> to, to put sort of a traditional manager in charge of the innovation team. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and um, we hope to host you again soon on one of our Innovation Leader Live calls or at one of our in-person events like the Teach-In, which happens next month in Boston, or the upcoming field studies I mentioned, which are in San Francisco and Washington, D.C. in early 2017. Um, thanks for tuning in, and have a great day.